I want to share something with you, but I, it's very hard for me to, to see a scripture um, on the screen or in the Bible and, and not uh, get something from it. You know, I guess um, maybe different people have different callings and different giftings, you know? There's, there's people that truly have a, a calling to be an evangelist, and they're anointed to be an evangelist. And it's almost like it doesn't matter what they say, God anoints their evangelism. You know what I mean? Without, without giving you names, I've, I've heard people that were anointed evangelists, and what they said was almost nothing. And I've seen people who are anointed with gifts of healing, and, and on and on and on. Anyway, um, when you're hopefully anointed to teach, God gives you a lot of understanding of the Scripture. Because how can you teach the Scripture if you don't understand the Scripture? And it's just something God does. Students need teachers, and teachers need to be anointed. They need to understand, and you can't get a lot of understanding just from a book or somebody else's revelation. You have to get it direct from the throne. So... I feel I would be remiss if I didn't share that last song, just so you know. That comes from Psalm 56, and there's an old custom in Judaism. Uh, it's not around so much today um, because things have changed, but this predates Yeshua. I'm talking about 1000 B.C., where at a funeral, they would pass around a bottle, and you would actually put a tear in that bottle to to signify that God doesn't let your tears just hit the ground. In other words, if God's not around when you're crying, the tears are going to hit the ground, right? It's almost like saying he doesn't care. But they would collect them in a bottle, meaning that God is able to store your tears, and at just the right time, he could convert those tears into, into joy and, and just, just toss them right back to you. That's why it says in Psalm 30, he turned my mourning into dancing. And I bet you that every one of you pretty much can tell me a story when you were in mourning. Something horrific happened. And then at some point, God turned it into anybody by a show of hands? That's pretty, that's pretty good testimony, yes? There's nothing greater than eyewitness testimony, by the way. Nothing. Nothing. In the court of law, there's nothing better than eyewitness testimony. A few weeks ago, we shared about Mother's Day. You know how I feel about my mom. Uh, you know, we're very close. I think mothers are wonderful. And um, I think it's only fair, being that tomorrow we, we celebrate corporately in this nation and other nations, for that matter, Father's Day. Uh, we share a little bit about fathers. Um, I'm somewhat of an advocate for men. Um, I, I like to see men empowered to be the priests of their household. That's what I like to do. I also like to pastor pastors. Uh, I just think it's a, a tough job being a, a, a father and a husband. Uh, not that uh, being a mother uh, and, and a wife is not. By no means, I'm not saying that. I just think um, the role of a father is, is, is difficult because most fathers are not trained. A lot of little girls are trained by their mothers how to be mothers, but a lot of fathers aren't trained how to be a father. That's where the whole idea of bar mitzvah comes in in Judaism, where you, you take this child in a community, and the elders of the community, the men come around this young man at 13 and say, you are now entering into manhood. You are walking through, you're not a man yet, just like when you got married. You're not one, not even close. You're going on a journey of oneness. So he's going on a journey of manhood. And the men of the synagogue of the community come around this young man and train him and help him and steer him. Now, we don't have that today in our modern-day believing community because we call that legalism. You know, bar mitzvah, that's silly, that's legal. A bunch of rabbis, a bunch of Jews did that. That's silly, right? It's incredibly not silly. And it's incredibly right, according to the Scriptures. With that being said, let me tell you where... Um, Father's Day came from, just so you have a little history, it's not much. The idea came to a woman, Mrs. Sonora Smart Dodd. She was in a church in Spokane, Washington, and she was hearing a sermon about Mother's Day in 1910. Um, you know, she heard the sermon about Anna Jarvis, who lost seven of her 11 children, and felt that she, mothers, should be uh, honored. 
So it took uh, the United States of America only four years from 1910 to indoctrinate this as a national holiday, President Woodrow Wilson. The same situation happened in 1910 for men, and it took till 1972. Why four years for Mother's Day and 62 years for Father's Day? It was proclaimed a national holiday by former President Richard Nixon. I believe men get the short end of the stick on a regular basis. I do. And, um, you know, I think a lot of women have men fairly figured out, or at least they think they do, because men tend to be quite simple. And so um, they, they, they feel that they have men figured out fairly well. Now, a lot of men that I've been around, they really struggle with trying to understand their wives or their daughters. They just struggle with understanding women. Anybody know what I'm talking about? But I have, I have great news for you, <laughs> men. They just came out with a book called Understanding Women, and I want you to see it. Don't fret, that's just volume one. <laughs> They're waiting for the second volume to come out. Now, you know I'm only, you know I'm only kidding. Let me, let, me, let me tell you what I tell everybody in premarital counseling. A woman is looking to be cared for. A woman is looking to feel that she's number one. A woman is looking to feel like you put her before you put yourself. You're hunting, you're fishing, and everything else that you love. And if you will protect her, if you will be her knight in shining armor, I guarantee you she will be your damsel in distress. That's it. Now you understand women, okay? Women, how did I do? Thank you. That's what happens when you lose your father when you're young and you have three sisters. And one bathroom. You learn how to get along with women. It's a, it's a very sad situation, though, in our American culture. 30% of all children have no father. And of the 70% that do, most of them are absentee dads. And the number is astronomical. Think about that. Three out of ten kids will never see their dad. And it's, it's crucial to have a dad. Little girls that don't have a dad, they tend to... Uh, search for love, and the first person that comes along that says, I love you, and they usually continue on in that vein. It's just fact. It's not my opinion. And sadly enough, uh, in our culture, Father Knows Best, with shows like Leave it to Beaver in the 60s, became Father Knows Worst with shows like The Simpsons. In fact, they had, I never watched The Simpsons, I never watched it, I would never watch it. Why would I watch it? Why, why would I watch that? For what purpose? To show me how, how, how God wants us not to act? I don't need to watch that to know that. Fathers are crucial. They're crucial uh, for teaching for discipling or disciplining. Disciplining and discipling is the same thing. We think discipline, we think a paddle. Now that's training. Dis disciplining is training. And, and sometimes there's ramifications. You have to have that. Do you remember there was a man in the Bible who did not restrain his two sons? And they lost their life and he lost his as well? So teaching is not enough. There has to be restraint, obviously. But the part that I think men don't get is they have to nurture. I, I think we somehow, I don't know if you were raised by a tough guy. My, my father was incredibly tough. Uh, one of the toughest guys I know. Would not back down from anybody. Uh, I, I've, I watched it. But my mother did not want him to act tough around me because she wanted me to be sweet. She did not want me to be tough per se. But it was almost impossible in the environment I grew up with to stay sweet. It was almost impossible. You'd get just mauled. So it, it just, sadly enough. But, but I learned a lot from my mother, and I, I, I think nurturing is very important for a father. Nurturing, to be sweet and show a sweet side. 
this, this business about big boys don't cry? Wow. I think Yeshua was a big boy, and he wept plenty. See, you can't, if you're going to be a believer, then be a believer. Do you know what I'm saying? If you're going to be a believer, then you've got to smell like a believer. You've got to think like a believer. You've got to act like a believer. You gotta, I mean, if you want to be a believer, be a believer. If you don't want to be a believer, don't be a believer. It's okay, but, but choose. You can't serve two gods. So stop letting the world and some worldly theories keep rising up in your walk. It's going to obliterate it. It's going to de-anoint you. It, it's going gonna, it's gonna to push the Holy Spirit right out of your tabernacle. It will leave like it left in Ezekiel's day. There's, there's nothing wrong with not being so tough. It's okay. It's all right. You really can be nice. I know you want to be. You just got to let yourself be. For me, uh, I have three uh, biblical fathers that, that I'm crazy about. Uh, you might have others. This is not like, this is, uh, now it's just my opinion. Okay, and you might have a different opinion, and you're more than entitled. I, I, tell, I tell my flock all the time, you have a right to be wrong. <laughs> the first one uh, is Moses. Moses was a father to about a million people on the conservative side. It's more, it's more like two million if you do the math. If you know 603,550 fighting men aged 30 and up left. You know, a lot of them had wives. There was a lot of children, so it's, it's more like, but I'm being very conservative. I'm just saying, he was a father to a million. Some of us struggle with two kids. Uh, an incredible father. Let, let me show you Moses' heart, and then we'll move on to our next example. Um, you know he was dealing with uh, people. See, we, we like to say, well, they were difficult people, like the children of Israel were difficult. You're difficult people. People are people. You understand? Somebody says, oh, there's two people warring in your synagogue. Really? Two people aren't getting along? Go figure. Guys, you, you can't get along with yourself. People are people. You understand? That's the way it is. So he was dealing with people. Not Israelites, not Jews, people. You understand? I mean, how many church splits have we had in Macon? I, I just take, I take offense when they, oh, the Jewish people are grumbling. Listen, we don't have a market on grumbling. You guys do a wonderful job of it. Human beings, it's called human nature. Now, some of the people in my family have been been grumbling for centuries so we just do it really well but the rest of the world is catching up very nicely it says here in numbers 14 this was you know numbers 14 you know where we're at they sent the spies in from the tribes the spies went in and they came back with a horrific report even though god said i'm giving you the land it's pretty amazing after what god did right they didn't believe him for something else they didn't believe him for less sound familiar some of us have been delivered from wonderful things, and we don't believe God for less. Okay. So we're people. We have a human nature. We have a human side to us, okay? Nobody here is fleshless. Okay? Nobody here is 100% spirit. Moreover, all the people of Israel, guys, it says all the people of Israel. It's not like he had like three difficult people that he was dealing with. Can you imagine two million people grumbling? Listen, some of us can't handle when the baby's crying for more than three minutes. Two million people crying? Do you understand what this guy had to deal with? And who are they grumbling against? Not against Moses, Moshe, and his brother Aaron. The whole community told them, we wish we had died in the land of Egypt. See, there's an old saying, you, you could bring the person out of Egypt, but sometimes you can't bring Egypt out of the person. People are used to being enslaved. Ah, it was better the old, you ever see about the old days when we used to crank the car. No, it wasn't better when we cranked the car. It was lousy. I remember the 70s. You had a car over 50,000 miles. You were on the side of the road. Now they're getting warmed up at 100,000. 
Good old days. Good old days without AC, right? I never had any growing up. I like it now. In fact, I feel like we're hanging the meat. Are we opening up a butcher? It's like 20 degrees in here. Anybody feel cold or you're all right? Yes? Does anybody feel warm? See? What do you do? <laughs> See? This is what I deal with every day of my life here. You understand? That's why I don't ask that question. I don't send around surveys. I care what you want, but I don't care what you want. I care what he wants. We wish we had died in the land of Egypt or that we had died in the desert. We just wish we were dead. <laughs> that's, that's better, huh? Who needs life? We should have died. Why is Adonai bringing us to this land? Where will we, will we die by the sword? Our wives, our little ones, you know, you're a jinx. We've been taking his booty. Wouldn't it have been better for us to return to, wouldn't it have been better for us to be under harsh slave labor where we had no dignity? We were beaten and treated horrifically, imprisoned. Our wives were mistreated. We were embarrassed and humiliated in front of our children. Can you imagine? Some of you every now think about that. Ah, it wasn't so bad in the world. I don't know what world you were in. But I'm happy to be out of Egypt. And they said to each other, let's appoint a leader. This is, this is classic rebellion. Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. The three stooges. We still have it today. Let's appoint a leader. One that God didn't appoint. That's going to get you some brownie points with the Lord, huh? And return to Egypt. That's what happens when you appoint your own leader. Moshe and Aaron fell on their faces. Isn't that beautiful? Look at what's happening. They are complaining and grumbling and sneering and being ornery and, and ready to take them out. Like, why don't we just kill them? You see, if they're going to appoint a new leader, they've got to take Moses out. Let's, let's kill him. Like they did with Joseph. Let's kill him. Let's take him out and let's get a new leader. So what does Moses do? He should have said, what are you, you know what you're playing with here? Do you know what God you're dealing with here? You saw, what does he do? No, he doesn't try to correct them. He doesn't try to show them where they're wrong. He intercedes. That's called mercy. A guy after God's own heart. Right? When we deal with people, we tend to want to crucify them. But when God deals with us, we want mercy. They fall on their faces. That means just they hit the deck, crying out to God on the behalf of people who want to take them out. Incredible. They fell on their faces. Continuing on, it says, but just as the whole community were saying they should be stoned to death, I told you I wasn't making it up. It's not conjecture. They were going to kill him. Just then, just when they said they had the stones, they go, ready? On the count of three, just then, one, two, maybe Moses was like on his face like this. Maybe, maybe not, I don't know. But the glory of Adonai appeared. Can you imagine? Uh-oh, daddy's home. Uh-oh, to all the people of Israel. I mean, the glory cloud was there. Everybody saw it. Not good. Adonai said to Moshe, listen to what he's saying to him. How much longer is this people going to treat me with contempt? Not you, me. You're my mediator. So when they treat you like that, they're treating me like that. Ultimately, it's on me. How much longer will they not trust me? Especially considering all 
that I've done. You know what? I'm going to strike them with sickness. Destroy them. And make from you a nation greater and stronger than they are. Meaning, I've done it before, Moses, with the flood. I'll do it again. I won't strike them with water. I'll strike them with fire. I'm taking them out. Okay, they've been driving you crazy. They're driving me crazy. I'm taking them out, and we'll start fresh. You know? I mean, your wife's difficult. Divorce her. Find somebody nicer. Remember what I tell you? The grass is only greener over the septic tank. Oh, if I were your wife, I'd treat you so nice. I can't believe she... Yeah, right. So that's a, that's a pretty good deal, no? I mean, if I was Moshe, I don't know if you were Moshe, I might, I might contemplate it. The dry, all right, we'll start over, and we'll start with a new group of people, and they'll respect me, and I'll be able to lead with authority. And sounds like a good deal, right? Nah, you wouldn't have done that. You're too nice. You don't know what you would have done. You've done worse with friends. Don't talk to them anymore. It says, now look what Moshe responds. He says, when the Egyptians hear about this, and they will, they will hear because... There was such fear going before the children of Israel that nations were quaking. Hey, their God is, man, he's tough. Just get out of the way. Whatever they want, give it to them. So they're going to hear. He's not being manipulative. He's trying to pull mercy from God's heartstrings. It says, because it was from among them that you by your strength brought this people out, that you brought them out from the Egyptians. They're going to hear about this. They have heard that you, Adonai, are with this people. That you, you, Adonai, are seen face to face. That your cloud stands over them. That you're protecting them and delivering them. And you promise to bring them to the promised land. That you go ahead of them in a column of cloud by day and a column of fire by night. Continuing. If you kill off this people at a single stroke, then the nations that have heard of your reputation will say that the reason Adonai slaughtered this people is that he wasn't able if you do that, I don't know, it's going to tarnish your reputation. Now, do I think he was going to do it? No. No. God wasn't going to do it. He was testing Moses' heart just like he tests ours. Does he have a right to do that? You better believe he does. He's the creator. Sure, just like you have a right to test your kids and see what they're going to do. And Moshe passed the test with flying colors. And then he speaks words from the scripture that Adonai spoke about himself back in Exodus. He says, look, you, you said you were slow to anger. You said you were rich in grace. You said you would forgive offenses and crimes. And then he begs him, please, please, Lord, forgive the offense of this people according to the greatness of your grace. Isn't that beautiful? That his grace is great. Just as you have worn with this people from Egypt until now. And what do you think Adonai did? I think he smiled and go, that's my boy. That's why he's called the servant of the Lord. He's got a heart like mine. He's a chip off the old block. So, I think Moses was a great dad. Anybody in agreement? Okay. Second great dad to me was King David. You might disagree. You're entitled. But I think he was a fantastic dad. He had a very dysfunctional family in many ways. And one son in particular absolutely connived, manipulated, and politicked. Yes, that's what a lot of politics is about. Winning people to your side by granting them favors. That's politics. For the people, my eye. And it's nothing new. It's been around for a long time. The first politician was Satan. When he politicked in the heavenlies. For many years. To convince a third of the heavenly host. 
to side with them. He was, um, Absalom was really, what a son, absolutely determined to kill his father, got him kicked off his throne, kicked out of Israel, left humiliated, dejected, won over his counsel, his advisors, his commander, and would not stop until he completed the task and the mission of taking out his father and becoming king. Well, you know the story. Absalom gets three spears passed through him. Joab takes him out, and they have to send the news back to the king about the battle and the results. So here you go, 2 Samuel 18. Listen to this. Achmaetz, who was the son of a priest, he wanted to bring the news, but he always brings good news, so Joab said no. Called to the king, Shalom, prostrated himself before the king with his face to the ground and said, Blessed be Adonai your God who has handed over the men who rebelled against my lord, the king. What is the first thing the king asks? He says, handed the men over, but he's not, he's not concerned about the men. What's the first question? How's my kid? Imagine that kid. Look at his heart. How's my, is everything all right with, with my son? Achmaatz, when Joab, Joab sent the king's servant, and me, your servant, I saw a big commotion, but I didn't know what it was. See, he wouldn't tell him. The king said, go and stand over there. So he went and stood over there. Continuing three more verses. Then up came the Ethiopian, and the Ethiopian said, there's good news for my lord the king. He was the messenger. For Adonai has judged in your favor and rid you of all those who rebelled against you. He's going to be installed back as the king. Judah and Israel are going to come together under one roof, and the king will live happily ever after. Again, what's the first question the king asks? How's my kid? The, the Ethiopian answered, May the enemies of my lord, the king, and all who rebel against you in order to harm you be as that young man is. Can you imagine now? He's cut to the heart. Trembling, the king went up to the room over the gate weeping, wailing, inconsolably crying. Listen what he says. Oh, my son, Avshalom. My son, my son, Avshalom. If only I had died instead of you. I would have given you the kingdom, son. I would have given it to you. An amazing daddy. Sometimes we kick our kids to the curb for a lot less. Mercy. A lot of mercy. And last but not least, my favorite father is the great Shaul, the Apostle Paul. Let me show you why. Second Timothy, he's writing, says from Shaul, it's a letter. It's a letter. It's not, it's not big theology. It's a letter. Shaul, an emissary. That's an apostle. That's a messenger with a specific message. If somebody says to me, I have people that come to me and say, I'm an apostle, I go, what's the message? They're like, what do you mean? I said, what do you mean? What do you mean, what do I mean? <laughs> Who deemed you an apostle? What's the message? And I'm not talking about a message, I'm talking about a specific message. An apostle goes and clears the way for the evangelists and the teachers to come in. Very few, very few have an apostolic calling. An emissary of the Messiah Yeshua by God's will not man's calling, which holds forth a promise of life through being united with Messiah Yeshua. To Timothy, the letter is written to Timothy. My dear son. Guys, what does this tell you? You don't have to be married. Well, in this day and age, you surely don't have to be married to have children. But you don't have to have biological children to have sons and daughters. I would like to see every single one of you mentoring somebody and discipling somebody and having a son and a daughter in the faith and i don't mean once in a blue moon i mean a real son or daughter in the faith somebody who can call you father grace mercy and shalom from god the father and the messiah yeshua our lord i give thanks to god whom like my forebears now you know he's writing this from prison he's not writing this from the ritz Carlton. 
He's in chains and he's waiting to die. Second Timothy. I give thanks to God, whom like my forebears, I worship with a clean conscience. My forebears, those who've gone before him. He's showing respect for those who've cleared the path for him. As I regularly remember you in my prayers night and day, as I pray night and day, I think of you, son. He's a good father. I am reminded of your tears. Why was he crying? Because he was ripped away from having a relationship with him and imprisoned. So his son misses his daddy. And I long to see you so that I might be filled with joy. In other words, I see you. You don't have to say nothing. The moment I see you, I'm happy. Sound familiar? <laughs> Hit a heart like God. You know the moment God sees you first thing in the morning, he's happy? You don't have to do nothing. Now, you might go apart your day, apart from him, and that breaks his heart. Because he knows it's going to cause some serious trouble and wreak some serious havoc for you and others. And me, for that matter. But first thing in the morning, he's happy to see you. You don't have to do any pomp and circumstance. No performance. I recall your sincere trust, the same trust that your grandmother and your mother had. You see anything missing? Where's, where's grandfather and father? Ah. Had issues back then too, huh? Sure. The problem's been around for a long time. It's just getting worse and worse and worse. Okay, so those to me are three wonderful fathers. One that's fathered many, one that fathered sons that he didn't biologically produce, and a father who had an incredible, merciful heart towards a son that just wanted to take him out. However, the most phenomenal father goes far beyond this call. Way, way beyond. Yeah. He's been the father to many. He's been the father to those he didn't biologically produce. And he's been to the father of those who wanted to kill him and said horrible things about him. Cursed him and mocked him. And still, still willing to extend forgiveness and mercy. You're not going to get that nowhere in the world, guys. You won't even get that from yourself. I uh, don't have a, a favorite story per se because I love all the scripture, but if you, if you put me into a corner and said pick one, it, it would be Luke 15. In Luke 15, there is a, a trio of parables. A parable is not to be taken literally by the very definition. If Yeshua says, and he sat down and taught a parable, it's figurative. It's, it's a metaphor. It's, it's an earthly story with a heavenly message. In other words, he's telling a story to people, human beings on earth, that has a, a message from heaven for them. That's what a parable is, basically. And he talks about these three parables. First parable is about the lost sheep, lost coin, and the lost son. And they have to be read together, I think. Look at how it starts. It says, the tax collectors and sinners kept gathering around to hear Yeshua. They were attracted to him. Obviously, you keep seeing them, and, and the parashim and the Torah teachers kept grumbling. So you have an incredible contrast. The Lord said to me, wear black and white. I don't have a white suit, so I had to go a little cash. But he said, wear black and white, because what you're speaking about today is black and white. There's no, there's no gray. And I love, I, the Bible has given me so many answers to life. People say, I have more questions. I, I got so many answers from reading the scriptures. It, it made so much sense to me. It was so incredibly logical. And I love the contrast. I love every time God speaks this contrast. And there's a wide chasm between that contrast. And you and I have to pick a side. You can't walk on a fence. You'll fall. And sometimes you'll fall to the wrong side. You've got to pick a side. So you've got tax collectors and sinners, and you've got perishing and Torah teachers. Contrast, yes? This fellow welcomes sinners. That's what Yeshua did. So if we're going to be Yeshua-like, should we be doing anything different? I love fellowshipping with believers, but I try not to do it too, too much because that takes me out of the game. It's safe. 
But that's not what we're supposed to be doing only. The tax collectors were detested by the Jews because they were totally greedy and totally defrauding. They were ripping off the people. They were ripping off the people so much, and sadly enough, they were connected with Rome, the very people who were oppressing the people. You, can you imagine? You know, you'd want to say to the tax collector, you're, you're a Jew. You're supposed to be one of us. And you're totally ripping us off, and you're on the take, and they're totally manipulating you, and this is what we got to deal with. They were hated. Hated. And for obvious reasons, like I said, harsh, greedy, and defrauding. And then you've got sinners. Let me show you the word. Hamartolos means devoted to sin as a lifestyle. Do you see the difference? Guys, this is very important. Pay attention to this if you don't see anything else because this is going to clear up something for you that probably you had questions forever. There's a difference between sin and a lifestyle of sin. It's a huge difference. Everyone in here is a sinner. You will sin this week with a thought, a word, or a deed. Guaranteed. But is your lifestyle sinful? If you are walking in a sinful lifestyle and you're saying, hey, God's okay with it. No, he's not. And then you fall into this category, and that's not a good category. You understand the difference? A lifestyle of sin and sin popping into your life and catching you maybe off guard? But people that are in a lifestyle of sin, whatever that is, whatever that sin is, and they're not fighting with it, they're not struggling with it, they're not asking God to deliver them, they're saying, oh, it's okay, God, I, I, I know that's what it said in Leviticus, but I don't believe that anymore. You're wrong, sweetie. It's not true. You've changed the rules on God. That's not, that's not fair. So there's a big difference. These folks were in a lifestyle of sin. They could care less. They were like, I could care less. There is no God, and if there is, I could care less. Sadly enough, what God was trying to protect them from was themselves. Their human nature. Because no man's an island, and when you sin, you destroy. Golly, it's hot in here now. What did you put that thing on? What do you go, from like 68 to 108? I know we're talking about contrast, but this is ridiculous. Yes, I am 100% Jewish. Look at the root word. The root word for sin is, looks very similar, but there are root words sometimes. You gotta, to wander from the laws of God, meaning that the Ten Commandments, I could care less. I could care less. Honoring God, honoring my parents, adultery, there's nothing wrong with it. I could care less. Lying, stealing, I could care less. That's, that's you see the difference? It's a huge difference. It's a huge difference. But don't, don't be a, a grace abuser either. Don't stay in that sin longer than you have to. You might die in it. Get out of it, man. It's not good. Get out of it. Struggle with it. At least fight with it. Luke 15, 4, 9, 24. You have the three stories, and you have the same word. What are we highlighting? If one of you have 100 sheep and loses one of them, doesn't he leave the other 99? Where are they? They're in the desert. They're not in the pen. That's very important for you to see. Where are they? In the desert. They're not in the pen. See? People think, well, they're saved. Not necessarily. No, darling. He, he, he is contrasting the Pharisees, the self-righteous, those that would never, ever admit that they sin. Not me, darling. No, I've been going to church for 40. I could care less. The story opens up in the first two verses. He says he's got Pharisees and he's got sinners. He loves the sinners because he can't get to the Pharisees because they think they got it going on. They got a corner on the holy market. They won't really humble themselves. All the hoopla. Doesn't mean nothing. God sees it all. So 
So they're in the desert. They're not in the pen. Something very important for you to see. But he keeps using this word lost, which in the Greek, as it's used here, means to be destroyed, to be rendered useless, to be wasted. See, we're not garbage. There's no way that God's creation is garbage. No, we're far superior to the animal kingdom. We're definitely superior to the plant kingdom. And God forbid that a rock out praises you. No, we're the best God's got. We're, we're a phenomenal creation. Really, we are. God even made us self-healing. If you, don't, if you get a, a, an infection and you take nothing, chances are we'll go away in 10 days. You might not want to deal with it for 10 days. So you rush to the medicine cabinet, right? You should rush to, to God. But we were found on the garbage heap, but that's not where we're supposed to be. That's why he takes us from the garbage heap, and he sits us with princes, and we become the royal folks that we were supposed to be. Royalty. And I tell people all the time, is eternal life wonderful? You know, eternal place with God and the heavenly kingdom that's coming? Yes, but that's not the big issue for me. That's not what drew me to God. I didn't repent to get heaven. I didn't repent to get heaven. I repented because the Spirit came over me and I realized, what have I done? How many people have I hurt? This selfish, disgusting lifestyle of mine is deplorable. I need to change. I want to change, but it doesn't look like I'm going to be able to do it myself. So can you do something about it? And lo and behold, yes. That's the power of God. And that's what I was looking for, a change. I was heaven wonderful, yeah, but I, I got to live here a long time before that happens. And he talks about life and abundant life here. And to break the curse and to breathe forth generational blessings is phenomenal. It's beautiful. And to become an overcomer, to then give glory to God. I told you, through Adam's sin, God lost creatures. Through Yeshua's salvation, God gained sons. He gets more glory from you than the angels. The angels, it's like an automatic door. They're, they're praising them all the time. That's what they do. But when you praise them, you've got to make an effort. You've got to decide, yeah, I'm going to shut this off. I'm not going to watch that. I'm not going to talk to you. I'm going into a praise session. He gets more glory. Yeah, he gets more glory for sure. We're not supposed to be rendered useless, and we're not supposed to be wasted. And this is what the enemy wants to do after you're saved. He wants to constantly render you useless, either through temptation and falling to sin, or through talking in your ear and saying, you're worth nothing. You'll never change. You're the same old, look, you just did it again. You're the same old person. Face facts. You're who you are. You're scripted. Baloney. Not true. Not true. God could change your spiritual DNA, and he's doing that right now. Metaphorically, loss means to be given over to Gehenna. Eternal misery. Does God, is God, does God even remotely uh, enjoy that? Just the opposite. He told Ezekiel, don't you dare, prophet, don't you dare Tell the people that I take any joy when they're lost forever. In fact, it breaks my heart. Kills them. Now, check this part of the story. Luke 15, 11 through 13. I love this. Again, Yeshua said, now again, so now he's telling the third story. He just talked about the lost coin, the lost sheep. Now he's going to get to the lost son. He goes, so again, Yeshua says, a man had two sons. Contrast, not three sons, not eight, just two. Contrast, always con The younger said to his father, Father, give me the share of the estate. He's an estate owner. What does that mean? He owns land with cattle. He's not raising cherry tomatoes like Bernadette and I. He's raising cattle. And he's not talking about a man particular in the first century. Like Lot was rich. Why? Because he was raiding cattle. And what was going on in Sodom and Gomorrah? They had a booming economy. And when people are booming, they eat steak. 
the places I go, they eat a little bit of rice, like this much, sometimes once a day. Because that's all the money they have. But in a booming society, we eat steak. Where's the beef? So he's talking about a man, metaphorically, it's a parable, who's wealthy. He's got a huge track of land and he's got cattle, big bucks. He's rich, filthy rich. But this young boy, and he's a young boy, teenager, 14, 15, how do I know he's not married? Unwed. He'd be married by then. It would have been arranged. So the father divides the property. That's crazy. Why is it crazy? It's against the law. Leviticus 25, 23. The land is not to be sold because the land belongs to me. You can't sell the land. The land belongs to God. You know, this land is your land. This land is my land. Poppycock. This land is his land. That's why Israel's his land. He can give it to whoever he wants. You got no say. And that land that you own is not your land, it's his land. And that tithe is not yours, it's his. Give it up. Give God his due. It's mine, it's mine, it's not yours, nothing's yours. And so for that man to give his son the share, you know what his son was saying in Judaism? I wish you were dead. It was highly humiliating and deplorable. In that community it was the worst thing it's like you know when you see some sons or daughters that are just you know out there and they say the most disgusting things to their parents on a regular basis this is worse the whole community would know and he had to sell the land off to give him his money he had to sell the land he didn't have the money laying around they didn't have money he had to sell the land off so now you've got somebody else occupying that land. Who knows what they were going to do? Maybe they're going to open up the wrong kind of store. You follow? And then generationally, he can't bless his children or his grandchildren because that's how you bless them. You didn't leave them money. You didn't send them to college. You left them land that they could work and make a living. You follow what he was doing? Through this incredible, horrific act, he was cursing the generations after him. Now you see the magnitude of the story that Yeshua knew and his audience knew but we don't necessarily know because we don't put it in its context okay we look at it through Western eyes right Western eyes the scripture and we have a Greek mindset but no that's why here you strap on your boots and get into your Jewish roots because it's important does it change the story? Not necessarily, but it deepens the story. So, he gets his share, and he's off. Dad, take care. He's supposed to be running the estate. He had a very important position. He had all these people working for him, but he's gone. What happens to the estate? What happens to the business? After all the father did... Work and toiling when it was maybe a little small. You ever see that? And then the son takes over and they're like, you know, the meetings, the CEOs. What do you do? Just took it over. Father did all that work. And so he squanders his money. Look, he had a lot of friends, right? Yeah, rich people make friends easy. As soon as he lost his money, what happened? Yeah, he humiliated his father. He humiliated his family. He humiliated his clan. He humiliated his tribe. In fact, he humiliated the whole nation of Israel. Now, what has to happen? You know the story. You, you've read it a thousand times. He, he comes to his senses. This is, this is a prerequisite to being born again. There is no other way to be born again. It's a prerequisite. It's an indispensable fact that one has to come to their senses before they can be born again. They can't, Jesus, come into my heart so I can have eternal life. No, I'm born again. No. Mm -mm. It's not what Yeshua preached. Yeshua said, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. John the Baptist said, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. Acts 2.38 says, repent. 
be immersed in the name of Yeshua for the forgiveness of sins and receive the Ruach, the Holy Spirit, and it is not changed. And we can't change it. He comes to his senses. Now, this is what has to happen. He comes back into town, and he has to come out before the whole community. It wasn't like the way we live now. There was one synagogue in the middle of town. Everybody lived around that synagogue. He'd have to be publicly humiliated. Flogged, maybe, in front of the townspeople. But this is what he'd have to do. He'd have to come back, grovel, and kiss his father's feet in front of everybody. It's not so terrible. My kids kiss my feet every other day. <laughs> who's up tonight? Who's up? What's a... Who's on rotation? I know, but in the row, who's up on the rotation? I'll go home, check the chart. Look, look, look at the next few verses. It's really quite beautiful. What you're getting is a glimpse of your father's heart in this parable. You really are. You're getting a definite glimpse. Yeshua is letting you know the heart of your father. You might not believe it, and there's no way I can make you believe it, but that's what he's doing. And when you believe it, it's going to change everything. Not when you, in theory, not in theory, not when you speak it, I, don't care, I could care less. Now, when you know the scripture verses by heart, it doesn't mean when you believe it. In fact, more than when you believe it, when you know it. Faith is knowing. At last, finally, I mean, okay, the kid's broke. He's starving, actually. It says he was starving. He was getting the pods that they were feeding the pigs, and you know how detestable a, a, a pig is to a Jewish person. So he's, he's really, sadly enough, living in a bad way. He's in a hurry. Rock bottom. You can't get any more rock bottom than he was. At last he comes to his senses and he said, any number of my father's hired workers have food to spare. They're treated wonderfully. An estate owner. His father was a good man. He treated everybody wonderfully. They, they were fed incredibly. It wasn't like they were eating, you know, rice while, while the sons were eating steak. They were all eating well. They're all being taken care of. That, that's the right thing to do. It's right. It's just. And then he says, these little workers, I'm, 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 I'm going to inherit the estate. I'm the estate owner's son. And his workers are eating, and I'm starving to death. So he's, I, he's got nothing to lose because he's going to die. He's literally he's going to starve to death. He's got nothing to lose. By the way, it was said by many, many a philosopher. If you win, you win everything. If you lose, what do you lose? What do you lose? You can't lose what you don't have. With God, you can only gain. You can't lose. You can't lose what you don't have. And so he's working his repentance, which is beautiful. This is right. Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. Meaning, not just you, but, but against God. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. This is really good repentance. This is where it's at. Like one of your hired workers. So he got up, he, he practiced the lines, he figures out what he's going to say, and he gets up and he starts walking back to his father. That's small f. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him. Obviously, you've heard it a million times. His father obviously was looking for him. He wasn't home in the estate, sitting in the jacuzzi, saying, I could care less. Obviously, every day, and probably a few times a day, he went out and surveyed the horizon after he got off his knees, crying out to God, begging God to bring his son home. God, I don't want nothing. I don't want the estate. I don't want nothing. Just bring my son home. And maybe he went out three times, five times. I don't know. Maybe he asked the workers, look out for him. I know one day he's going to come back. He's moved by compassion, which you're seeing the heart of God. It's a compassionate heart. Compassionate. God is moved by compassion. God so loved the world that he gave. He gave out of his love. 
he ran. Now, is that, is that important to the story, that the father ran? It's very important because estate owners don't run. Never. It's undignified. It would humiliate them to run. They would have to, they wore robes, flowing robes. You had different robes so depending on what part of society you were in. And they would have to lift up their robe and show their undergarments. They don't do it. Taboo. Because they might lose respect from the community. So what does he do? What is he saying? He, he's out of his mind. He sees his son coming. He's been praying and fasting for, for who knows how long. I, he's, he's not even thinking I could care less what people think. But obviously by his actions, he can care less what people think. So he runs, and he throws his arms around him, around his neck, and keeps kissing him, and keeps kissing him, and he won't stop. What is he doing? The son wants to kiss his feet. The son wants to bend down and kiss, but he's not letting him. The townspeople want him to. The older brother, right? Hey, you know what he's done? Yeah, same things you've done. And then some. You know, I had a friend that had a, a church, and his church was made up of all ex-drug runners and prostitutes. Boy, was their praise and worship beautiful. We've all prostituted ourselves in some way or another. He won't let him, the, the people, come on, humiliate him. And he's like, no. No. Why? He already has been humiliated. Wasn't his pain of being in a distant land, away from his father, away from his father's protection, isn't that enough? Why do we pour salt on people's wounds? They're wounded. They're hurting. I don't care how big and bad they act. They're hurting. That's why they act so crazy. They're acting out. They're hurting. They're dying to be, to be told, you know, you're a great guy. You've got incredible potential. Some people never hear it. They're married 40 years. They don't hear it. It's all people want, you know. They just want to be loved. But, guys, if you're looking to be loved like the way God can love you, it can't be done. It can't be done. You could have a measure of it, but not to this extent. So he throws his arms, kisses him. His son says to him, Father, I have sinned again. Dad, I'm no longer to be No, Dad, you don't understand. He's crying. He's crying. He doesn't know what his father's going to say. Is his father going to say, you know what? You had your chance. Your brother stayed. See ya. He hung in there. Or, son, kiss my feet. We'll talk later. Get out in the field and work. Or, listen, kid, this is your last chance. One more time, we're done. Who knows? That, that was, that's not the heart of God. He says, shh. And he starts to have this major fiesta. Right? That's what it looks like to me. The kid's half naked, probably. He gives him a robe, a royal robe. The best one, he says. The best one. Bring out my best. Put it on him right away. Give him a ring. He's back in the family. He's, he's back in the family. And shoe his feet. My son is no beggar. Put shoes on his feet. It's, it's a perfect picture of, of repentance, of penitence, of a broken heart. And look at the fragrance that that penitence brings forth. Forgiveness. Totally. And you can believe that. For you and I, who, who, who try to process through this life with the Lord, who at times fall short, when we cry out to God, this is the response we'll get. When there's real repentance, this is the response we'll get every time. No ifs, ands, or buts. And if you think you're not going to get that response, you have no anointing to share the truth of God's gospel.
What a, what a beautiful picture of our redemption in this story. And, and our final exodus. You ready? This is it. We're almost done. Luke 15, 17 through 18. That's Teruah. Remember, we have three feasts left, right? The fall feast. We've already seen the spring feast. We've been saved. Passover. Our sins have been buried. The old man's dead. First fruits, newness of life, filled with the Holy Spirit. We got that. We got that. But the fall feast, it's coming. And it's depicted right here in the story of the prodigal son. At last he comes to his senses. He heard the shofar. How did he come to his senses? He heard the shofar. We're going to hear the shofar. He returns. Luke 15, 19 through 20. Confession, forgiveness, he's covered. Kippura, he's covered. There is no expiration. All your sins are written in pencil. You close your eyes, it's permanent marker. Everybody needs a bailout. It's basic accounting. When, when your assets are less than your liabilities, you have a negative net worth. You owe, it's called a deficit. Ask anybody in our country about the deficit. It can't be paid back. Impossible. I don't care who gets in that office. It will not be paid back. And if we don't figure out some ways to reduce it, it's going to explode, just like we see in Greece and Spain and other countries. But God's giving you an opportunity for a bailout. I'm not playing around here. I'm not messing around. I'm not goofing around. Okay? It's not some little cute, bring Jesus to my heart. This is serious business. We've all incurred debts. Those debts have a price tag. The price tag is too big for you to pay. Without coming to the door of repentance, you can't get into the kingdom. Without coming to that door, you can't receive the Holy Spirit. Without the Holy Spirit, you have no power. You'll be the same. You won't change without the Holy Spirit. You won't change without it. It's the only thing that could change you. It's a power to overcome things, do things that we couldn't do in the natural self. And look at Sukkot, 1523. Bring the, bring, <laughs> celebrate good times, come on. Let's celebrate. That's Sukkot, man. It's coming. It's not here yet. Your greatest day, I don't care how great it is, you can't compare it to when he starts his reign. You take that other bottle? Oh, there it is. But ready? There's one more feast that we forgot about. What's on? Shabbat. How quickly you forget. Shabbat, it's a feast. It's one of the seven. Three spring, three fall, Shabbat. Look at verse 15, 24. It says they began celebrating. Do you see where it ended? After the millennial reign, the new heavens and the new earth come. Heaven is on earth, and the party won't stop. You believe me when I tell you, you're going to be you. You're not going to be an android. You're going to be a human being. But all the memory banks will be deleted of all the sorrow, pain, and suffering. Otherwise, how could you have tears? And never, ever will another sorrow come in. That's why you're going to never stop partying. Let me um, ask the praise and worship team to come forward, please. I've said this to people many, many, many times, and I'll say it to you. It is much easier to become a father than to be one. And a truly rich man is one whose children run into his arms when his hands are empty. It's too easy today to buy people's love. Sadly enough, a lot of people are easily bought. 
The word prodigal, even though we think negatively, actually means to exceed, to overflow, to be extravagant, and to be open-handed. I don't know about you, but don't you love generous people? They're very hard to come by. They're very hard to come by. Um, why is that? People are cheap. That's why. But when you find somebody generous, there's, there's some people I know, I've got to fight with them to pay for the bill. I've got to fight with them. And they're constantly, oh, i got to. It's amazing. And they're not doing it to get it. They, you know, I'm talking about truly generous people. There's no string attached. When I sense a string, I cut the string. I don't, I don't want, don't put that over my head. Oh, give me a sip of your soda. I gave you potato chips yesterday. Get, get lost. <laughs> Get out of here. That's no gift. Get out of here. No, it's manipulation. It's manipulation. Say it's easy. In business, you can manipulate people so easy. Buy them a big screen. They, go, they owe you. So I don't, I don't want, but I, I, every now and then, I meet people that are incredibly generous. And it's be- isn't it beautiful to be around them? It's just, you just love, yeah, your family. Her family. No, nobody rich. They, they all live in the apartments. They're all... You know, hard work, no, 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 no money. But they're just, they're just generous. They just, I got it, don't worry about it. Yeah, I got it. Yeah, you know, whatever they have, yeah, yeah. It's beautiful to watch. It's just nice. Who is more generous than God? Why, why would you look a gift horse in the mouth? Why, what, 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 I don't understand. Help me understand it. I don't know how to, how to extend it to you, but how, why would you? But nobody can make you repent. One of the most beautiful times I ever had with all the places I traveled was a Christmas day in a prison with a Jewish guy who was a cop. God told me to go visit him, and he was, it's such a sad story. He was with a young lady, and he sent her in, this is back in Daytona, he sent her into a 7-Eleven, and two guys started messing with her and grabbing her. Well, he grabs his service revolver, and goes in. These guys had rap sheets a mile long. In fact, one was up on a murder charge. And hands down, the evidence, it was hands down. Eyewitnesses, the whole thing. But this is all inadmissible. He goes in, and they draw, he draws, shoots one of them, shoots both of them, kills one, and because he could have driven away, he goes to jail. And it's not good for a cop to be in jail. I go to visit him. Remember the third time the Lord said, he's coming. Didn't, 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 ask, didn't ask him, just shared with him. Just shared with him. Just, Lord, what, what, please, just anoint me to say whatever needs to be said. Not, hey, would you like to come into the kingdom? The third time, he goes, Rabbi, I, I don't know how to pray, but can I, can I just pray? I said, go ahead. And he starts crying. He goes, God, I'm so sorry all the things I've done. I'm so sorry how I never showed you any respect, no honor. I'm so sorry for the way I've talked about you. I'm so sorry for the things. That it was the most beautiful thing. It was the third hour, New Year's Day, and it felt like the prison cell that I was in with him was filled with angels. I couldn't even, I could, it was so thick because he was really being cleansed from the inside out. He was rep- I didn't even have to teach him about that. And he truly became born again. Truly. He got a new heart that day. He knew it. He started thinking different. He wasn't perfect, but he was, he was starting to move into perfection. You know what I mean? He was starting to think different and act different, and he was feeling different. It was legit. Nobody could refute it. Something really happened. That's what I look for. You don't have to come up here. I, w- I, I don't know if I'm even comfortable with that, even though we, we, we like that kind of stuff, and I'm, I'm big on evangelizing out than in. But if that's you, if that's something you really want to do, and you don't have to do it even right now, but if you do, and listen, guys, I, I'm not one of these, well, you know, what would happen tomorrow, but I, I just got to tell you, we just did Nancy Dawson's husband's funeral. You know, one day the guy was talking to me about prophecy, and, 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 and Israel 
and eschatology, and the next day he didn't know who I was. Life moves very fast. I'm 53, I can't believe it. It's like, what happened? You've got to be kidding me. I, I was just like, I was, you know, it was like yesterday. I was, I really miss my dad. I just really do. It was a really bad thing the way he went out and it left a very bad taste in my mouth. I always felt very protected with my dad. I just felt like they're not going to get me. Not, not if dad's even remote. They're not going to get me. And when I lost my dad, I felt so lost. And I felt so vulnerable. And I felt so insecure. And I didn't know how to securitize myself. So the first thing I did was I made believe I never had a dad. Because the pain was too, is too gruesome. And my friends were as lost as can be. My mother was a basket case. My sisters were gone. I had nobody to talk to. Way back when. He's dead like 38, 39 years. And so that's what I tried to do. And then I thought, oh, it is crazy. So then I went looking, shopping for dads. And my friends would get jealous because some of their fathers would try to father me. Then I hooked up with all my martial arts teachers and they were wacky packs. And then that one day, I, I met my father. He's been so good to me. Not because of the ministry or my family. Yes, that's all wonderful. But, but, but I have friends that have, you know, sometimes people say blessed. I, I got friends that are worth $425 million. They wouldn't know your shoe if they fell over them. So you can't just go by that. And, and they have nice wives and beautiful children. You can't just go by that. It's just I really believe that he likes me. Even at times I don't like myself. Or at times people don't like me. I just believe he likes me. And that might sound arrogant, but he forced me to believe it. He says, you've got to believe it. Don't say those things about yourself. It's not me that is speaking those things. Don't, don't say those things, Greg. And I think, what would, what would happen if I, my son was hanging out with his friends or any of them said, I don't think my father really likes me. And, and I was passing by and I heard that. <gasps> I'd be a dagger. I, I, I don't know if it would go through my heart or through my back. Maybe both. But that would be the last thing I'd want my children to say. You follow? And I'm just, I'm as imperfect as they come. Yeah. Don't nobody amen that. What do you know? I don't know if you're like me, if you're a human being. Every now and then you just get a little funky, a little crazy, a little ornery, a little nutty, a little impatient. I don't know. It happens, right? But I still consider myself a pretty good dad and then I think of my heavenly father it's such a difference it's such a chasm I wish you would consider at some point maybe you've all done it already but I wish you considered just coming to a place of a little brokenness a little humility and just just coming before him and just being honest I mean, do you, do you get eternal life? Do I believe in that? Yes. Yeah. I believe the choice where you reside is yours, but resurrection is, is going to happen. Just to let you know, most of the world believes in it. Judaism believes in afterlife. Islam believes in afterlife. Christianity believes in afterlife. Hinduism, even Buddhism. Maybe reincarnation, but they believe in afterlife. Everybody does. This isn't it. And if this is it, what a sad state of affairs. What a sad state of affairs. I was telling Nancy and, and her crew I was speaking to, you know, when you're young, you have so many insecurities, especially today, trying to fit in, trying to be cool. Isn't it driving you crazy? Isn't it exhausting for you, little ones? Trying to let everybody like you and trying to say the right thing and wear the right thing and do the right thing. Golly, you're just like 10. Just have fun. And then you get married and you think, great, school's over. Now it's easy street. <laughs> should, I, should I refer back to the volume one? No, because now you've got to make decisions for your family. They're dependent on you. 
heavy duty decisions that you're never really totally sure if they're the right one. And then you get old. And that's always fun because it's one ectomy after another. <laughs> it's like, what are you doing this week? Well, Monday I'm going to see the dermatologist, Tuesday I'm going to see the heart specialist, Wednesday I'm going to... Seriously, that's what happens. Things start breaking down. You know, even Jack LaLanne dropped dead if only he took better care of himself. But you, there comes a time. Now, what I'm painting is the picture. Is that it? And then what about the sorrow and the situations that we have and the betrayals and all the hurt? This is not it. No. No way. We have been robbed of our excellence. And God is going to restore it because he's good and he wants you to be with him forever forever god did not send his son to condemn but to save it's not sending you to hell it's not sending you to hell that's your choice and if you don't know him it's a hellacious situation anyway it's hellacious without prayer it's hellacious without believing there's a god who cares about you it's hellacious without thinking there's an afterlife. Golly, Lord, how do you do it? Don't you get tired of doing it all yourself? Man, don't you get tired of always driving? Don't you want somebody else to drive? I'm just saying, it's real. I'm, I'm telling you, it's real. And if you come to that place of brokenness and really repent before God and nothing changes, you don't see no difference, you say, then I will never share it again. But it's real. And you need to know. And I've told you, yes, I have, to the best of my limited, finite ability, I've tried my best. Do I, do I want you to just make a profession? No, absolutely not. I want it to be real. I want it to be real. God, help me. God, I don't want to be this person anymore. I want to, I want to be sweeter. I want to be kinder. I just I want to be different, but I, I've been like this for so long. Could, 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 can, could you work a... What, a miracle? Yeah. I could take a guy like Saul, who was killing my best believers, and turn him into the greatest apostle that ever walked the face of this earth. Yes, I could bring you from the ash heap and sit you in a royal place. Yep. I could take you from the projects and bring you to the palace. I could do it. I did not do this on my own. What I'm doing and sharing overseas, I did not do it on my own. No way. I will not take one iota of credit for it. Never. No way. I am fully convinced that it's 100% God. Every day I get up and I come here, I am convinced that all this is the work of a wonderful, beautiful, forever faithful, magnificent Father. And I'm here to tell you that if God was such a prodigal, so, so open-handed, so generous, so wonderfully giving, and so flagrant with His love, why don't we try to follow suit? I mean, you can't be the block, but we can be a chip. Amen? Sing me a song. I want to hear a song. It'd be one of the ones you sang, but I, I just want to hear a song. You know, I got to tell you, if you think that I'm really like happy and and wonderful and you know and happily wonderful, I don't mean I'm wonderful. Happily, this is my best time of the week, right here. There are 160 hours in the week. If I could bottle this, I. No, the Spirit of God's here. I know it. I, I cry out all Saturday morning for it to come, and Friday night, that's what I ask. And I believe He shows up, so I'm happiest here. When I leave, I start to get a little less happy. It's like, it's just a little anticlimactic. It's like, oh, golly. 
And I get glimpses during the week, but it's busy. Stuff goes on. This is my, this is, this is my oasis. This is my best time, Shabbat, when I feel like I have God's undivided attention. And I feel like the only child. I feel like it's just me and him, you know? Me and dad. Just walking and I can't do no wrong. No matter what anybody thinks, I can't do no wrong. And I feel like he's like, Dad, do, do you want me to do so? He's like, no, man. You're good just the way you are. Come on, kid. Let's go hang out. I'm, I'm as happy as a lark. No performance. Just me and Daddy. And he penetrates my soul with his love. This penetrates my soul. And I just feel so lucky. I just feel so lucky. And I wish I could bottle this and, and drink it all the time. And, and there's times I get it and there's times I don't because stuff happens, right? Kids, life, Bernadette. I gotta tell you, I, I thank God that I don't have to love her as a believer, that I truly, that I truly love her. What, what I mean by that is, let me explain. I know people that go, well, I, I love this person, you know, because they're, oh, boy, that would be so gruesome to me. You know what I mean? Just to, to love her as a sister in the Lord or something. No, I really like her. She's got a, um, yeah, she's, she's a tremendous uh, friend and a tremendous confidant. And, and God has blessed her with a really neat character. And uh, I'm glad he's blessed me with that partner. And um, yeah, it's nice. And um, anyway, I, uh, I pray for you and I hope uh, that this weekend is, is, is beautiful. Uh, for some of you fathers that might run through a, an issue or two of guilt because I'm sure there's at least one in the house that's going to do that. I don't see my son or we don't talk. Or that. Guys, just just repent of it and, and let the Lord wash it away. What's done is done, but he does a magnificent thing. It's like an etch-a-sketch with your heart. He can really wipe it away, but you got to let him take it. you you got to let him take it. You can't question his forgiveness. It's a terrible thing for me to look at my children and say, I love you, come here. And they're like, no, you don't. You're not forget. No, I am. I really am. And there's something wonderful about asking for forgiveness, but there's something even greater extending it. It's a beautiful thing to look at somebody and go, I love you. I've missed you. It's okay. Man, God loves to do that. Let him do that with you. And if, if you've messed up and you've fessed up, then go to the person today and go, look, I've messed up. I have. But today's today. Give me a shot, man. We can make this thing better. You're not going to be able to do it without God, but you can make it better. It could be a whole new day today. It could be a whole new day tomorrow. The days are short. Time is short. Make most of your time. Father, redeem the time for my congregation. Redeem the time. And for those of you that don't have a father, I always send my mother a Father's Day card. So be blessed, kids. Have a good weekend. Have a good day tomorrow. I love you very much. Very, very much. If you'll uh, link up. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. And may the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace in the name of the Prince of all peace, Yeshua.
Shalom.